Can you name every 90s teen horror movie that was ever made? Better yet, which one would you say is your favorite? Your least favorite? And what about all the forgotten ones in between? While the 90s teen horror craze has not always been regarded as highbrow cinematic fare, it should at least be recognized for the postmodern revival of the horror genre, which by the mid 90s had kind of fizzled out into tiresome 80s holdovers. And although they eventually saw a decline of their own heading into the new millennium, there was a time where these movies ruled the world. So in this video, we're gonna be ranking every single one of them from the worst all the way to the best. What is up Scream Team? Zach Cherry here and if you guys are into horror movies and categorizing them into arbitrary lists as much as I am, go ahead and hit that subscribe button and set those bell notifications to all. That way you can be alerted to even more ranking videos just like this one. Because the term 90s teen horror can encompass a wide range of different movies, we're going to be very specific with what criteria will make up this list. Firstly, the movie should for all intents and purposes be categorized as horror, or at least fall within the parameters of the horror genre. It can contain thriller and comedic elements, but it can't strictly be a thriller or a comedy. Secondly, even though the title of this video states this as 90s teen horror, there's a very specific timeline in which these films were released, which approximately covers a five year span between mid-1996 and mid-2001. Thirdly, we're only going to be covering the movies which were released theatrically, as there are way too many obscure Scream knockoffs that I wouldn't possibly be able to fit them all in here. Lastly, in order to be considered part of the teen trend of horror, the movie should at least have a cast primarily made up of teenaged, college-aged, or young adult characters who are featured prominently on the film's poster. Kind of like this one. However, I will state right now that although Final Destination does meet all the previously mentioned criteria, I don't personally consider it to be part of the 90s teen horror wave as it's the first chapter in a 2000s franchise whose themes were way ahead of the curve. With that omission, we still have a total of 17 films, which gives me enough material to piece together a divisive list which I'm sure will trigger somebody's delicate sensibilities, but just remember that this list reflects my own personal tastes and not yours. With that in mind, do me a solid and toss this video a thumbs up and meet me in the comment section down below to let me know what your rankings would be. Let's get started! Coming in at dead last is Soul Survivors. After getting into a horrible car crash which claims the life of her boyfriend, a college girl starts to experience a series of ominous hallucinations while also being stalked by some nefarious figures wearing masks. If you've never heard of this one before, that's completely forgivable, as it was one of the last movies ever released before 9-11, which combined with its terrible critical response resulted in the film quickly disappearing, and probably for the best. This movie was so bad that it took two full years to find a distributor, and was heavily marketed as being from the same producers as I Know What You Did Last Summer and Urban Legend, even though it shares almost no resemblance to either of them. The only thing that remotely ties this movie to the rest of these rankings is its misleading poster art, which features Eliza Dushku front and center, despite the fact that she's barely in the movie, and essentially plays a less nuanced version of her character from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I really hated this movie when I saw it in the theater, and I still hated it when I watched it again last week in preparation for this video, which if you feel so inclined to see for yourself, you can stream it for free right here on YouTube. The biggest problem I have with this movie is that it mostly feels unfinished. We're really given no semblance or structure of a plot to understand what it is we're watching, and there are no definable set pieces to link any of the action together, which pretty much leaves the whole thing feeling like filler. In 16th place is The Rage Carrie 2. In this extremely posthumous sequel to the 1976 original, we follow Carrie White's half-sister Rachel, who has also inherited the same recessive gene that gives her telekinetic powers. After being tormented and humiliated by a group of high school jocks, she is pushed to revenge by killing them, along with all the popular kids at school in a blaze of destruction. Despite the fact that this is next to last on my list, I actually like it way better than Soul Survivors by leaps and bounds. However, it's still a very frustrating movie for many reasons. First of all, it needlessly runs too long, making us watch through repetitive story beats before we get to any major action, which also never feels fully paid off due to the fact that everything is painstakingly telegraphed to us. As a sequel, it doesn't really add anything to the mythology of the original story other than shoehorning in Sue Snell, who just pops in now and then as part of a B storyline, which literally serves no purpose by the end of the film, other than to remind us that this is a sequel to Carrie. Having said
said all that, I think this movie quite possibly captures the most authentic depiction of high school life out of any movie on this list, with some exceptions, of course. But there is a grittiness to it that feels more so rooted in real life rather than the slick, polished finish of the typical Kevin Williamson 90s fare. Because of that, I think this movie has a little bit of an edge to it. In 15th place is Urban Legends Final Cut. This sequel, mostly in name only, sees a film student competing for her university's coveted Hitchcock Award by basing her thesis on an urban legend serial killer only to have her crew and fellow students fall victim in the exact same manner as the folklore tales which have inspired her. I think the biggest detriment to this movie is that it's not really a sequel as much as it is a spin-off, but it also kind of fails to recreate the same sense of mystery and intrigue that was introduced in the first installment. On top of that, it mostly plays out like a very low rent straight to video release with its lukewarm direction and flat cinematography. There's also this one chase sequence which is very spatially confusing, where the main character goes from a music recording studio to what then looks like the woods behind Camp Crystal Lake, followed by a very long underground maintenance tunnel. I think what sets this apart from its predecessor is that it more so pays homage to classic Hitchcockian tropes than it does to its slasher contemporaries. It's not necessarily a bad concept, and I actually do respect it for trying a fresh approach. I just don't think it was executed properly. In 14th place is An American Werewolf in Paris, more so a spiritual sequel to 1981's An American Werewolf in London. This film follows a trio of thrill seekers who travel across Europe performing death-defying stunts, which leads main character Andy to stop a mysterious woman from jumping to her death off of the Eiffel Tower. He soon becomes romantically involved with her, only to discover she's actually a werewolf and is turned into one himself. This is my guiltiest pleasure on this list. I know objectively it's not a great movie, and arguably it might not even be a good movie, but it's still one that I thoroughly enjoy, and I think that has a lot to do with how steeped in 90s pop culture it is. The soundtrack alone features Bush, Cake, and Smash Mouth, and Tom Everett, who stars, is essentially 90s royalty, and even though the comedy feels very tonally imbalanced with the film's more gothic overtures, I don't get as annoyed by it as I do with some of the other horror comedies on this list. On the negative side, there is some atrocious CGI effects for the werewolves, the plot kind of meanders in the second half, and I would probably rank this a bit higher, but other than the things I already mentioned, this movie tends to be pretty forgettable. In 13th place is Bride of Chucky. In this fourth entry of the Child's Play franchise, we're introduced to Chucky's girlfriend Tiffany, who through her own murderous scheme acquires the destroyed remains of the killer doll and resurrects his spirit with voodoo. Hijinks ensue, at which point Tiffany also finds herself trapped inside the body of a doll, whereupon the two travel across the country to find a mystical amulet that will undo the spell, all while leaving a trail of death in their wake. There are two movies on this list that were absolute favorites of mine growing up, which sadly have not held up quite as well today despite my nostalgia for them, Bride of Chucky being one of them. The thing is, I absolutely love Jennifer Tilly in this. I love Jennifer Tilly's chemistry with Brad Dorf, and I think that every moment where they get to play off of each other is pure horror comedy gold. The problem with this movie though, which as far as I can tell most people tend to agree on, is that the B storyline, which eventually converges with the A storyline, completely drags this movie down. And that of course is anything to do with the human protagonists of Jesse and Jade. I think the reason it doesn't work here is because in the past there's always been that one character, which for Chucky has always been Andy, who knows what's really going on and just can't get anyone to believe him. In the case of this movie, you have two characters who are not only five steps behind the audience at all times, but also are now suspicious of each other, which adds an unnecessary layer of drama that just gets frustrating and stale very fast, especially after the movie repeats the same story beat for the third time. I'm still a fan of Bride of Chucky, don't get me wrong, it's just that rewatches get progressively harder to sit through as everything from the middle onward just flounders in its lack of ingenuity. In 12th place is Idle Hands. Unbeknownst to him, a teenage slacker becomes the vessel of an ancient demonic evil that starts to murder a bunch of people to comedic effect. With the help of his stoner friends, he must find a way to save the day and win the heart of the girl next door who's been chosen as a sacrifice to open the gates of hell. You've probably pieced together by this point that I don't prioritize horror comedies. It's not that I don't like them, they're just not my immediate go-to. I did rank this higher than Bride of Chucky though, because I find there's a much better 
through line for the story and characters, but there's still only so much of this big comedy I can take before it just starts to sound like a lot of noise, especially when you consider that nothing about this is scary at all. Having said that, I still find this movie to be highly entertaining from start to finish, and I appreciate that it employs some pretty great effects and overall unique visual style and Devon Sawa at the height of his 90s popularity. It's just not a movie that I find myself revisiting all that much. In 11th place is I Know What You Did Last Summer. After graduating high school, four friends are involved in a hit and run over the 4th of July weekend, causing them to cover up the accident and vowing to never speak of it again. One year later, they discover that somebody knows about what happened and begins stalking and tormenting them. Full disclosure, this is not my favorite franchise, or anywhere close to it for that matter, but I do recognize its premise for being among one of the best on this list. This movie is also slightly more atmospheric for an era of horror where everything felt like it was exactly the same. For that reason, I really do love the first act of this movie. I think everything right up until the moment where Barry is run down is classic mystery and suspense at its best. My problem is that almost everything after that is a huge disappointment. A lot of that has to do with the pacing, but also Jennifer Love Hewitt and Freddie Prince Jr.'s characters are really boring, and whenever they occupy the majority of screen time, it just brings the whole thing down for me. Having said that, I really do think that Helen, who was more interesting and sympathetic, should have been the main character here. Not only because Sarah Michelle Gellar is a generational icon, but because Julie is only really the final girl by default and does absolutely nothing to earn that title, other than the fact that she's still in the movie by the end, despite that a lot of her actions throughout are very counterproductive to her survival. In 10th place is I Still Know What You Did Last Summer. A year after the events of the first movie, Julie is still coping with the trauma of everything she's been through until her roommate wins them an impromptu vacation to a secluded island in the Bahamas, where during a hurricane, the fisherman returns to finish what he had started the previous summer. Yes, I am among a small group of people who actually prefers the sequel to the original because it at least embraces how completely ridiculous it is. I think it could have even gone a step further as there are still moments where it tries to take itself seriously, but Jennifer Love Hewitt at least gets to have a little more fun with the final girl trope. On the negative side, I'm still completely disinterested in anything to do with the character of Ray, who always just slows the movie down whenever he shows up on screen. Like with the original, there are some pacing issues here as well, but I find it's mostly at the beginning as once the characters get to the island, it starts to move along much faster. Also, this is the biggest offender of the jump scare. This movie has on average at least one jump scare every minute, and it gets very annoying very quickly. In spite of all that, when I watch this, I can easily shut my brain off, because while it might be bad, it certainly isn't boring. In ninth place is Scream 3. Completing the original trilogy, this chapter sees Sidney Prescott get drawn out of hiding after a new ghost face killer terrorizes the set of the latest Stab movie in Hollywood while taking credit for her mother's murder. I've been through this one many times before in other videos, so you can go check those out if you want a more detailed analysis, but I will say I think this one gets unfairly maligned. True, there are a lot of problems with the script, but the movie does have a lot going for it in its production quality, as Wes Craven's direction remains untouchable and the editing is still top notch. The make it up as they go along approach towards its development certainly made for a more disjointed entry, but it's still a pretty good movie with all things considered. In eighth place is disturbing behavior. After suffering a tragic loss, a troubled teenager moves with his family to an idyllic island community, where he soon discovers that the adults are signing their kids up into an experimental program, which brainwashes them into becoming upstanding straight A students, with the unfortunate side effect of gaining violent and murderous tendencies. Not including the opening or closing credits, this movie is probably around 75 minutes long, making it the shortest on this list. However, considering the runtime, the plot still feels pretty dense while moving along at a brisk pace. This is essentially the 90s teen equivalent of The Stepford Wives and has a very X-Files-like vibe about it, which despite feeling like an episode of television is quite atmospheric. I had only seen this once before, so I didn't remember a whole lot about it, but it certainly surprised me on my most recent rewatch. On the negative side, there's a lot of plot that gets glossed over, which may be a result of the shortened runtime, but it feels like there wasn't enough focus put on the dynamic 
between the main character and his family, which kind of undermines the central conflict of the film. With all that said, this is still a very enjoyable yet overlooked entry in the 90s teen horror catalog that should be given a lot more credit than it receives. In seventh place is Halloween H2O. Ignoring the events from Halloween's three to six, H2O picks up 20 years after the ending of the second movie with Laurie Strode having gone into hiding after Michael Myers' body was never recovered. Michael eventually tracks her down to Northern California, where she's now working as the headmistress of a secluded private school, with the dark secret of her past creating a rift between her and her teenage son. As I mentioned earlier with The Bride of Chucky, there's one other movie on this list which ranks very high for me in nostalgia factor, but has not aged particularly well in recent years, and that of course is H2O. In terms of this ranking though, it just falls really flat for me, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that Michael Myers is so far removed from what the shape is supposed to be. There's really nothing scary about him here. The movie, like I Still Know What You Did Last Summer, is loaded with empty jump scares, and in retrospect, the more iconic moments feel very rushed, and most of the kills are kind of neutered. Overall, this feels like a slipshod effort to cash in on the popularity of the teen horror trend, as this movie is more scream light when it should have been Halloween heavy. But before you at me, let me tell you what I think is good with H2O. I might be one of the few people who actually likes the change of scenery, moving the story from Haddonfield to Hillcrest Academy, which, by the way, was also used as the mansion in Scream 3. I like all the interactions between Jamie Lee Curtis and Josh Hartnett. This is my favorite portrayal of Laurie Strode out of the franchise, and I think the dynamic between the two really drives the story through a lot of the slower parts of the first half of the movie. And I like how once the action gets going, it doesn't ever really let up. In sixth place is Valentine. 13 years after being rejected and humiliated, Affiliated at a junior high dance, a former nerd seeks revenge on the five girls responsible for ruining his childhood by stalking and murdering them one by one around Valentine's Day while wearing a cherub-faced mask. Technically, this is the only movie here that was filmed outside of the 90s, but its influences are unmistakable. Valentine, to me, was probably the biggest surprise and turnaround I had for this list, as on my last viewing, I really enjoyed it. To be fair though, there are a lot of problems with it, but I I find the issues here are more forgivable than the issues I have with the previous 11 movies. Yeah, the characters are awful, the dialogue is pretty bad, and tonally, the movie tries to be way too many things, but aesthetically, it hits all the right chords for me. The kills are much more inventive than what we usually see in this type of slasher, the holiday theme and revenge plot are classic horror cornerstones, and Denise Richards is underrated as hell. This movie can mostly be summed up as good, trashy fun, and it's an extremely easy and satisfying watch, so I can't really see any reason why it deserves any of the hate it receives. The only thing I really think this movie is missing is a more conclusive finale, as we don't get a satisfying chase sequence or the typical killer vindication speech, but in a way, the fact that it goes against type adds to its charm and uniqueness. In fifth place is The Craft. A newcomer to a Catholic prep school falls in with a trio of outcast teenage girls who practice witchcraft. After invoking the spirit of a powerful deity, they begin to conjure up various spells and curses, which eventually backfires, resulting in grave consequences. The Craft holds a special place in my heart, because while not a work of art by any means, it is the most distinctively 90s entry of any movie on this list. Probably because it doesn't draw its influences from anything else's, it predates everything. But the interesting thing is that its time capsule-like quality makes it a movie that I can watch over and over again because it doesn't feel like it belongs anywhere outside of the year it was released. Therefore, it's just always stayed the same to me. Everything from the alternative soundtrack to Feruza Balk's iconic turn as the unstable Nancy Downs solidifies this movie as an ancient artifact to behold. It's also the horror movie equivalent of Mean Girls, even though The Craft was Mean Girls before Mean Girls was Mean Girls, marking this as a cliche that's been tried and true for decades. In fourth place is Urban Legend. A college student's sordid past comes back to haunt her when she becomes the target of a campus serial killer who patterns their murder spree off of various folklore tales thought to have only existed in stories. I understand that Urban Legend, while still loved by many, is not everyone's favorite, but I will go on record to say that I think it's one of the most underrated horror movies of the 90s. First of all, it has excellent pacing, with its kills spread across the runtime quite evenly. There's never a lull or moment where I become bored, since the mystery itself is always compelling enough to warrant a plethora of red herrings and intermittent bouts of exposition. As a fan of 80s horror, 
Order, it's also nice to see all the special cast appearances they were able to wrangle in, with the likes of Brad Dourif, Danielle Harris, and Robert Englund, as well as making a household name out of Rebecca Gayhart, which gives this a sort of greatest hits flavor. Urban Legend is far from the most original movie on this list, but in my opinion, it takes the simplicity of an all too familiar construct and perfectly forges it into the prototypical slasher. In third place is Scream 2. Several years after the Woodsboro murders, Sydney, now attending college, is tormented by a copycat killer who has once again drawn the attention of Gail Weathers, now an acclaimed celebrity journalist, whose tell-all book has been adapted into a major motion picture. It's rare that a sequel can come out less than a year after its predecessor and be considered just as good. This movie features some of the best moments from the franchise, including Sydney and Hallie's escape from the back of the police car, Gail's chase scene through the recording studio, and the opening murder at the theater. In a typical slasher, these would merely serve as set pieces to highlight the movie, but in Scream 2, they bridge together a compelling plot that expands on the mythology of the original and develops its characters even further. In my opinion, Scream 2 is one of the best horror sequels there is, because not only does it up the ante, but it also gives us a fresh new concept, rather than committing the ultimate sin of just repeating the same story over. I've talked a lot about my love for Scream 2 in the past, so if you want to hear a more thorough analysis, you can check out this video. Otherwise, I'm just going to start sounding like a broken record as I incessantly gush over how great I think this movie is. In second place is The Faculty. Six high school students from different social circles begin to suspect their teachers are being taken over by an alien parasite and band together to stop the spread and destroy the queen before it takes over the world. A common reoccurring theme with a lot of these 90s teen horror movies is that high school is terrible and full of unspeakable evil, and no movie on this list is a better example of that than The Faculty. This is essentially Kevin Williamson's horror movie equivalent of The Breakfast Club and is probably director Robert Rodriguez's most understated film to date, but it's also the most all-encompassing genre fiction of any of these movies as it has a little bit of everything in it without ever feeling like it's lacking in any department. Every time I watch this, I get all the thrills, scares, and intrigue I crave, but I'm also left feeling very satisfied by the end because it has an overall upbeat tone. It also has one of the best casts, with so many recognizable faces from so many other movies I love. And I've talked before about how large casts can drag a movie down by limiting its characters, screen time, and presence, but most of the core characters here are all very relatable and receive a well enough developed arc that it never comes up as an issue. I'm still waiting for a proper fact faculty Blu-ray release as the only one available right now doesn't include so much as a trailer in the way of any bonus features, which is downright criminal. I feel this is such a beloved movie by not only the fans, but the people involved in making it as well, that it really does warrant a lot more discussion and analysis. And finally, in first place is Scream. A year after the murder of her mother, Sydney Prescott is terrorized by a killer who targets her and her friends by using their love of horror films as inspiration for their deadly game. There's no denying that Scream breathed new life into the horror genre and is responsible for pretty much every entry on this list, with the exception of The Craft. Wes Craven's masterful direction is of course the pinnacle of this movie's success, but cannot overshadow the brilliant performances by its cast, Patrick Lussier's razor-sharp editing, and Kevin Williamson's genre-defining script. I want to thank my Patreon supporter Eric Champney. If you enjoyed this ranking video, you can check out more of them right now by clicking on this playlist. Until next time, I've been Zach Cherry, and I'll be right back.